You and I both know the real power in this world ain't magic, it's money. Are today's Disney films anti-Disney? Their themes and takeaways increasingly seem to be critiquing the company that makes them. Can you do that? Over the last 10 years, Disney's animated films and live-action remakes have not only foregrounded progressive messaging on feminism and diversity, they've also protested greed, monopolies, and big corporations taking over everything. In other words, these new Disney films are openly critical of the documented behaviors of the Walt Disney Company. Films like Wreck-It Ralph, Frozen, and Moana all feature pointed allegories about the evils of capitalism, while the live-action remakes have written anti-corporate messages into older films. The the contract says I hire them. They never stipulated for how long. But of course, all these films serve to help Disney itself rake in billions at the box office. And while their animated movies preach against late-stage capitalism's imperative to consolidate and form monopolies, Disney gobbles up companies like Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm, and Fox. Understanding this disconnect tells us about more than just Disney. It shows just how easy it is for corporations in general to perform political correctness and reap the social and financial benefits without feeling any compulsion to meaningfully act on their own messages. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and click the bell to be notified about all of our new videos. This video is brought to you guys by Mubi. We love Mubi so genuinely. It is a key part of our lives. Mubi is such an incredible platform. It has wonderful movies and interesting conversations around those movies. Mubi always picks something that's interesting, that's quality. I crave that curation today. You feel like you've actually taken in something substantial and then you think about it, you dream about it. It stays in your head. They have great taste. It's something for everybody. If you want to know about the world and culture and what's really fun and worth watching, check out Mubi. Right now, Mubi is offering our viewers 30 days free. Just click the link in the description below to start streaming now. Thank you, Mubi, for supporting The Take and for helping us bring these videos to you. early Disney films didn't have much interest in capitalism or the modern world of their times in general. They usually took place in fantasy lands or wild forests filled with talking animals. Most 20th century Disney characters are born into wealth and privilege, from Princess Aurora to Ariel and Simba. And this will all be mine? Everything. The movies that do include poverty, like Cinderella and Aladdin, treat it as a temporary embarrassment solved by a loving marriage that coincidentally provides near-infinite wealth. Given these pre-modern dynamics, it's no surprise that many Disney villains fulfill ancient archetypes. Schemers like Scar, Jafar, and Hades fit the mold of Shakespearean villains like Richard III, Claudius, and Iago. Two smart second bananas with designs on a throne they're not entitled to by blood. When I'm king, what will that make you? A monkey's uncle. And who are punished for attempting to disrupt the great chain of being. Snow White's evil queen and Frollo represent power-drunk rulers who can't bear to see anyone else succeed, an archetype that dates back to Greek and Roman tyrants like Nero and Agamemnon. These villains care about power and pride, nothing so tedious or practical as money, and they're impossible to imagine roaming a boardroom or a stock exchange because they tap into an image of power that predates capitalism and free markets. Towards the end of the Disney Renaissance, the films did start to incorporate more modern themes, following a shift in attitudes about economic justice. Pocahontas, Mulan, and Tarzan all embrace anti-colonial messages. The only thing they feel at all is greed. Even if their approaches to these problems have limitations or flaws by today's standards. Both Clayton and Governor Radcliffe seek to get rich by stripping native lands of resources, tying them to the mercantilist approach of early colonizers. When we put your furry friends in their cages. <laughs> Why? Why? For 300 pounds sterling a head. But while these villains are paragons of greed, they are brutes rather than businessmen, solving their problems through violence instead of complex economic maneuvers. No one was going to mistake Michael Eisner for Sean Yu.
After public sentiment shifted with the wreckage of the 2008 financial collapse, in 2009, Disney's Princess and the Frog showed a new willingness to engage directly with the dangers of money. Still, it would be a few more years before the studio fully embraced changing attitudes. The first Disney villain to encapsulate the greed of modern businessmen doesn't at first glance appear to be greedy, or modern, or a businessman. In Disney's 2012 film, Wreck-It Ralph, King Candy presents himself as the benevolent monarch of Sugar Rush. But Ralph and Vanellope eventually discover that he is a character from another game, Turbo. Turbo is the perfect metaphor for a corporate raider. When Road Blasters challenges his dominance, he takes it over and runs it into the ground, like the private equity behemoths that tanked Toys R Us and pay less. In taking over Sugar Rush as King Candy, Turbo latches onto a successful product, restructures its corporate hierarchy to put himself on top, and forces workers to compete for a chance to participate in the value they create. This event is pay to play! His final form as a cyborg, or virus that will try to keep growing and consuming the whole arcade seems symbolic of modern corporate behemoths who eat up all competition. And it came out exactly two days after Disney announced it would purchase Lucasfilm and the entire Star Wars universe. Over the last 15 years, the Walt Disney Company has become the epitome of a larger trend towards corporate consolidation, as fewer and fewer companies own everything. I can take over any game I want! It's dominated the film marketplace by snapping up Pixar, Marvel, Lucasfilm, and Fox. In 2019, the last year before the COVID-19 pandemic, Disney had nearly 40% of the market for all movies in the world, almost triple its next largest competitor. It produced all eight of the top films that year, and five of those came from studios it purchased. Disney creations like Wreck-It Ralph might critique greed and corporate takeovers, but Disney the corporation has embraced those methods to supercharge earnings for shareholders. I'm now the most powerful virus in the arcade! The year after Wreck-It Ralph, many people noticed Frozen's winking send-ups of classic Disney princess tropes like the damsel in distress, true love's kiss, and falling in love at first sight. Who married the man she just met? It's true love! But far fewer noticed how similar Prince Hans is to Turbo. While he may be in a medieval monarchy setting and use romantic trickery rather than computer code, Frozen's villain is, like Turbo, obsessed with snatching up someone else's creation. He's essentially a vulture capitalist, manipulating the rules to pull off a takeover and get rid of the competition. As 13th in line in my own kingdom, I didn't stand a chance. I knew I'd have to marry into the throne somewhere. Similarly, and more overtly, in 2014's Big Hero 6, the rich CEO Alistair Cray tries to buy the main character's invention until a former employee points out that the company's greed leads to shoddy business practices. Mr. Cray has cut corners and ignored sound science to get where he is. Undeterred, the CEO tries to solve it by throwing money at the problem. I'm offering you more money than any 14-year-old could imagine. The central conflict in 2019's Frozen 2 centers on the former king's attempts to build a dam that can harness nature at the expense of the local people. You see, the dam will weaken their lands, so they will have to turn to me. It's a plot that offers clear parallels to extraction capital mining of coal tan in the Congo or lithium in Bolivia, industries that provide the components of computers, which enable viewers to log on to Disney Plus and see Frozen 2 critique the exact practices that enabled them to watch the movie. Perhaps the recent movie that goes furthest in its message about the dangers of consumption is 2016's Moana. Maui's song, You're Welcome, has the feel of a corporate bigwig bragging about his contributions to the world while conveniently ignoring the destruction he has unleashed. The central irony encapsulated in the song's title is that Maui is calling attention to all he's given while he's actually in the process of taking Moana's boat. This paragon of corporate braggadocio is also specifically tied to the art of film, in that his skin is covered in tiny animated movies, and he triggers the apocalypse while trying to harness the power to create, the very power that Disney uses to make its billions. They believed if they could possess it, the great power of creation would be theirs. Furthermore, while Maui does reform and become a hero, the film's villains all represent the dangers of greed. The Kakamora are predatory pirates and the giant crab Tamatoa is obsessed with collecting shiny treasure and gobbling up innocent fish. 
Maui's greed triggers a darkness that begins to consume the world, threatening the survival of islands with rich cultural history and representing a powerful allegory for climate change in our own world. Where corporate-fueled global warming is raising sea levels that could submerge island nations across the world. As the life-giving Mother Earth-esque Tafiti gives up on humankind and turns into a fearsome threat, this echoes how our environment sends more and more extreme weather our way as a direct result of man-made pollution. Without her heart, Tefiti began to crumble, giving birth to a terrible darkness. All of this makes Moana a powerful and insightful portrayal of the dangers of consumption to our whole planet, way of life, and human existence itself. But it's a bit off considering that, in spite of Disney's stated efforts to curb their carbon footprint, in 2014 it still produced 1.63 million metric tons of CO2. Disney's anti-Disney messaging extends past the animated movies and into the live-action remakes as the new films align their stories with modern sensibilities and express their distaste for growth and takeover. In the live-action Aladdin, it's no longer enough for Jafar to want to be Sultan. His real crime is his desire to invade the nearby country of Shirabad. And I thought I had power before! First, I'll lay waste to those fools in Shirabad! And in Maleficent, King Henry's attempt to annex the Moors leads to his death and Aurora's curse. But if you can argue these changes are relatively small, the live-action Dumbo takes this critique to a wild new level. The remake expands on the original Dumbo with an elaborate story about a greedy impresario selling Dumbo's act to the masses. What makes the film so strange is that its villainous impresario sounds an awful lot like Walt Disney. Dumbo first introduces V.A. Vandeveer with language that evokes Disney's founder. The emperor of enchantment, but the architect of dreams. The character spouts phrases about magic and childhood made me a child again. that align perfectly with Walt Disney's portrayal in Saving Mr. Banks. Now, there's no greater joy than that seen through the eyes of a child. I mean, there's a little bit of a child in all of us. Although Vandeveer's Park is in Coney Island rather than Anaheim, Dreamland's rides also evoke Disneyland. The animatronic wonders of science mimics Disneyland's carousel of progress, and the Rocket to the Moon shares a name with one of the first rides at Disneyland. Even the Dreamland Circus suggests the Mickey Mouse Club Circus, a short-lived big top in Disneyland that was almost converted to Dumbo's Circus Land. Most striking of all, just before Dumbo's first performance, the film shows kids buying Dumbo stuffed animals dressed in yellow and red outfits. These dolls don't look anything like the blue and silver outfit that Dumbo wears in his performance in the film but they perfectly match the color scheme of the Dumbo dolls you can buy throughout Disneyland. While the imagery and language connect Vandeveer to Walt Disney the man, his financial deal-making ties him to the modern company. The future of the entertainment business is to bring the audience to you, and I've built that destination. Vandeveer takes control of Dumbo through a corporate merger, giving Max Medici stock and incorporating the entire company, as Disney recently did to Fox. Then, also like Disney and Fox, he proceeds to spin off the less profitable parts of the company through corporate downsizing. Van de Veer's fired them all. Crucially, these corporate machinations make him the villain of the film. When Van de Veer discovers that Dumbo's mother distracted him during a performance, he sends her to her death to protect his profits. So, Disney created a character that actively evokes their founder, then made him a corporate psychopath willing to orphan a baby elephant. Get rid of the mother. But sir, you can't just kill her. Why not? But why? Why does Disney keep making so many movies about how evil it is? In the age of social media, we increasingly expect both celebrities and brands to advocate for causes and publicly align with social justice issues, if they want to keep their money flowing in. The expectation that the things we consume will stand on the right side of history is even stronger when it comes to cultural products like films. In 2016, Matt Damon's film The Great Wall faced massive backlash for centering a white protagonist in a story about Chinese history. It's historical fantasy. The controversy helped tank the movie, which lost almost $75 million. 2017's Ghost in the Shell also lost money after controversies over casting sparked outrage. Ouch. Backlash against movies can obviously also come from people who feel that stories are too progressive, with right-wing pundits promoting boycotts against films like Frozen, Star Wars The Last Jedi, and Captain Marvel. But these boycotts evidently did little to hurt The Last Jedi and Captain Marvel's huge theatrical runs, or stop Frozen and its sequel from becoming the two most successful animated films in history. 
Films that embrace progressive values tend to make money, so aligning with the changing culture provides major financial rewards. This clearly explains Disney moving its animated films away from princesses falling in love to focus on female leads like Queen Elsa and Princess Vanellope, who foster platonic friendships and focus on fulfilling their own goals. Look, the code may say I'm a princess, but I know who I really am, Ralph. I'm a racer with the greatest superpower ever! And Disney's jokes mocking itself, with films like Moana, Enchanted, and Wreck-It Ralph gently teasing the tropes of its older movies. If you wear a dress and you have an animal sidekick, you're a princess. Is a strategic way of positioning its contemporary and most lucrative Disney princess characters as PC, culturally relevant characters whose merchandise you feel comfortable buying. The live-action remakes have also benefited fitted from including diverse and feminist messaging. Both Belle in Beauty and the Beast and Millie Ferrier in Dumbo are young female inventors, while Jasmine and Nala get new songs about embracing their power. I will be All this only goes up to a point that's never too controversial for a mainstream audience. For example, promises of LGBTQ inclusion have so far materialized only as fleeting moments or vague queer baiting. But most centrally, while these changes are progress, their purpose is financial rather than utopian. As YouTuber Lindsay Ellis, who has discussed how Disney changes the live action revivals to accord with modern sensibilities, put it, they aren't woke to make the world better. They're woke for you to buy stuff. With Disney embracing social justice to pad profits, it's also perfectly logical for them to pit their stories against the unpopular evils of greed and inequality. The more you have, the more you want. This entire approach depends on audiences not connecting the villains on screen with similar actions by the people or conglomeration behind the product. But Disney has several significant advantages making its narrow tightrope walk possible. The first and most powerful is that corporations are incredibly boring. It's easy to get fired up by cartoonish greed on screen, but much harder to sustain that fire when confronting complex antitrust negotiations or shareholder value propositions or departmental restructuring to promote synergistic integration. Very boring. Corporate Disney also benefits from time. Individual films have release windows, which make them vulnerable to a backlash that tanks the opening weekend, and even individual people may be brought down by controversies. But companies can wait it out until people move on to the next news cycle, as there are so many scandals these days that it feels impossible to track them all. The human world, it's a mess. Most of all, Disney benefits from the very thing their movies have primarily critiqued, enormous and ever-growing size. If you want to see a big blockbuster or go to a family-friendly theme park or buy the Olaf doll your kid desperately demands, chances are good you need Disney as much as they need you. Mega fans of Lucasfilm who don't want it incorporated into the Disney brand are still unlikely to protest by refusing to watch the new Star Wars movie and sacrificing their own experience of something they love. The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. Disney has become a company that is not only too big to fail, but too big to meaningfully boycott. So as long as Disney's movies align with the zeitgeist and make viewers feel what they want to feel in their entertainment, the corporation can pretty much do whatever it wants behind the scenes. You're only in trouble if you get caught. In a way, Disney's plot pivot to explicitly oppose greed, monopolies, and corporate misbehavior shows how far our cultural conversation has come. We've embraced fairness and economic and social justice to an extent that even multinational corporations have to fall in line, or at least perform that they are. Yet Disney's anti-corporate films seem to be having little discernible effect on the company's moral or business strategy, which keeps chugging along. Just keep swimming. Dumbo's vicious dissection of Disney's corporate strategy came out on March 11, 2019. Nine days later, Disney announced its official takeover of Fox. Ultimately, this disconnect demonstrates the real problem. It's much easier to talk about the right thing than to do it, and projecting the correct politics as a superficial PR strategy is a pretty straightforward ploy for corporations. Disney executives can build morals into their films without applying those morals to themselves because they know their audiences care more about the stories than the boring details of the company. In the end, the anti-Disney messages we're seeing in these films are all in service of making more money. So that's about as pro-Disney as it gets. The selfish man is like a mangy dog chasing a cautionary tale. This is The Take on your favorite movie shows and culture. Thank you so much for watching and for supporting us. Please subscribe and never miss a take.